so this is the first actually content uh, sort of seminar of uh, PEPS. And uh, what we want to talk on about today is uh, gender inclusion and equity in academia. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, sort of to introduce a number of very prominent speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, Professor Naomi Elmus, and she's uh, a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, Michelle Ryan, who's a professor in organizational psychology and also the director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at ANU. And then uh, last but not least, uh, we have Associate Professor Marit Kracht, and she's the director of the Center for Agricultural Economics. But we asked her today here because uh, she's also the Pro Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Inclusion of the University of Western Australia and has just developed a uh, policy for uh, the university and we're very interested in hearing her views. Um, before introducing the first speaker, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. And I would like to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And then finally, I would like to say that uh, we will record this uh, presentation and it's uh, for later use. Uh, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, you can always leave your video off when you're on Zoom, uh, but you can still post comments in the chat and they will be uh, read out by Winifred at a later stage. So feel free to participate and we'll, uh, we'll organize that. Charlie's gonna do the chat, remember? Oh, Charlie is going to do the chat, all right, great. Uh, okay, um, what I would like to do then is actually, um, oops, uh, no, actually we have the first speaker will be uh, Michelle Ryan, uh, and Michelle actually mentioned that she doesn't have any slides, so let me just stop sharing, and here we got Michelle, full view. So you have 15 minutes, Michelle, to just sort of uh, give us a bit of a general introduction and, and to, to put forward a particular case, yeah? Brilliant, thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, it's really nice to see everyone uh, online and in the room as well. Um, I don't usually do a talk without slides, but I thought I would just push myself a little bit given that it's only 15 minutes and it's always hard with the hybrid sort of thing if I have slides as well, I don't can't see anyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Michelle Ryan. I'm the director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. So this is a research institute at the Australian National University that was set up by Julia Gillard um, one of Australia's former prime ministers, our only female prime minister. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is really trying to, you know, just do cutting edge research to understand workplace gender inequality. And I guess inequalities more generally as well. Um, but then we work a lot with organisations um, and government to try and translate that research into practice. And then we sort of do a bit of advocacy as well. So a lot of talks and uh, events and those sorts of things. Um, so it's really from that base that I'm sort of going to be talking a little bit as well. So um, this talk isn't going to be so much focused on, on um, research, like a research talk, but really a, around policy and what research can do to speak to policy. So if we're thinking about gender inequality in academia and, and we're thinking about what it is and what we want to do about it, um, I guess I've got a number of cautionary tales, um, what we should not be doing. I think we often get told a lot about what we should be doing. Um, and this is a little bit uh, trying to think about what works and, and also what doesn't work. Um, so in some ways, I'm taking a little bit of an assumption that we're going to agree that there are inequalities within academia in terms of gender. And that might be inequalities in terms of representation. So the number of women that are um, at senior levels in decision making roles, it might be um, about the number of women that are PhD students, but and as I'm going to come back to later, I think it goes beyond that as well that we need to think about the experiences of, of women once they're in those positions, uh, whether they're safe within work environments, uh, whether their research is funded and acknowledged and valued, whether their contributions to universities are you know, similarly 
valued and, and taken on board. Um, so all of those things are things I think organizations and universities acknowledge. There's a, there's a big acknowledgement that there are still ongoing inequalities. So there are lots of initiatives that are out there that try and address those, try and fix them. And we can think about things like Athena Swan, um, which are initiatives to look at uh, representation and look at policy and practice and, and tie those to you know, um, awards that universities can have to demonstrate how well they're doing on the gender equality front. Um, but there are also at university level, at sort of faculty and college levels, at departmental levels and school levels, a lot of other initiatives that are put forwards to, to try and work out gender equality. So when it comes to seeing what works and what sorts of initiatives um, we should be looking at and what we should not be doing, um, I recently published an article in Nature where it really reflected on the university and research space and, and what perhaps isn't working so well. Um, and I talked about three different um, things that, that we sort of get wrong or sort of missteps on the way to trying to achieve gender equality. Um, so the first is that we should not just be focusing on numbers. We need to be looking broader than that. The second one is that we really need to stop trying to fix women. So we need to look at initiatives that go beyond just training and upskilling women. And the third is about how optimistic we should be um, and what are the consequences about being perhaps overly optimistic. Now, I've just rewritten that paper. It was only a really small paper. It was 800 words. It was an opinion piece, really. Um, and I've just expanded that for a... Uh, um, a, a British Journal of Social Psychology landmark article that's hopefully coming out in January. And I actually, so I expanded on all three of those things of what not to do. And I added a fourth one as well, because I had a bit more space. Um, and that's about intersectionality. So making sure that we don't assume that all women's experiences within academia or within the workplace more generally are the same, and that we look at intersecting identities um, where oppression and stigma and discrimination can take place. So so that's that's what, what I sort of want to talk about in my next sort of 10 minutes. Um, just expand on each of those points, if that's OK. Um, so the first one is about not just being about numbers. Um, often when we think about gender equality and when we think about where we start in terms of a gender equality plan or what we're going to do in terms of policy and practice, we often start with the numbers. So we look at how many women are in professorial positions, or we look at success rates of, of grants, say, for example, the Australian Research Council and how many women are getting grants, or we look at citation indices and, and look at where women are getting cited and those sorts of things. And I think those initial numbers, especially at that representation, um, is always a good place to start, um, but it definitely needs to go further than that. If we just concentrate on representation and just on those basic numbers, we often mix a big miss a big part of the story. So part of that is about the experience of women in those positions. So if we just focus on increasing the number of women, say, in STEM or the number of female professors, but we don't actually look at the why. Why are there not very many female professors, for example, then just shoving more women into those positions while, I mean, that's useful, it's good, there's more role models and those sorts of things. If we don't actually look at the why and understand the experience of the those women in those positions, there's still a lot that is, is left unsaid and unlooked at. So, one of the examples that I often give about why numbers are not enough um, is the research that uh, Alex Haslam and myself and others have done on the glass cliff. So the glass cliff is um, about what happens to women once they break through the glass ceiling and take on leadership positions. And our research shows that um, they tend to take on those leadership positions in times of crisis and when things are going badly. So I think a really topical example recently is Liz Truss before her um, Theresa May, if we want to look at politics, but we also see it in the corporate world. We see it in academia, we see it in uh, sporting contexts and those sorts of things as well. So if we only look at the number of women that are in leadership positions, we actually don't see phenomena like the glass cliff. Um, and if women are being put in le leadership positions um, when times are tough, when times are difficult, the research always also shows that those positions are precarious. So if we think of Liz Truss, 
45 days in office, you know, one of the shortest tenures that we've ever seen. Um, was that because of her uh, decisions and her policies, uh, perhaps? But was that exacerbated by the fact she was appointed in times of crisis? I think so. So we need to understand um, a lot more than just the numbers. We need to look at when women are, are appointed, what happens once they do, why might they have short tenures, why might their positions be stressful, why might it be difficult for them to shine in those sorts of roles. So if we look at, um, I don't know, if we translate that to academia, if we just put women in as head of departments uh, when times are tough, when there's crisis, when things are going on, uh, we could see that perhaps that might reinforce the idea that women aren't good at leadership. We might be setting women up for failure. We might be putting them in risky and precarious positions. And right on time, Alex turns up as I'm talking about the glass cliff. Hi, Alex. Hi, hi. Sorry. Yeah, I just had me to. I've, yeah, and I've got to rush off. Doesn't matter. Got, sorry. I've got a bit, I've got this lot going on. Lovely to see you, Michelle. Great. Thanks, Alex. So so then glass cliff um, and the glass cliff is just one explanation or one example of the depth that we need to be going into instead of just looking superficially at those numbers. So another one might be around women's safety, for example, or the culture of organisations. So if we just try and increase the number of women in a STEM department that has a very blokey um, culture where say bullying and sexual harassment is rife, that's going to be incredibly problematic. One, because you're just increasing the number of women exposed to those things, but two, they're also very likely to leave quickly and you're not actually solving the problem. You might actually be even exacerbating it. So what should we be doing if we're not just looking at numbers? We really should be looking at the whens, the whys, the hows, um, and trying to understand I guess the basis of the problem instead of just looking at broad numbers. So in some ways that really segues into the second point about not fixing women. So when I talk about not fixing women, it's sort of riffing on a number of things, but Catherine Fox, the Australian journalist, um, wrote a great book where she said, stop fixing women um, and, and why we should not be fixing women. And the sort of thing that I'm talking about here when I talk about fixing women are the sorts of initiatives that try and upskill women or give them skills. Um, and these things might be about women's leadership training. It might be about confidence and negotiation training. It might be about uh, trying to encourage women into STEM by increasing their interest in science, for example. Um, and we've all seen examples of these, right? So um, the EU had an excellent example of um, how not to try and increase uh, the number of women in STEM. They uh, Maybe 10 years ago or so, they had an in initiative called uh, Science, It's a Girl Thing, where they had a video where uh, women's sort of PPE goggles would turn into fashionable sunglasses and they'd be doing things in the lab and making makeup and lipstick and, and blusher and things like that. And every single female scientist that saw that initiative just was in absolute sort of outrage because the idea was that the reason that there aren't enough women in science is because it's just not um, interesting enough for women uh, in that because women have interest in makeup and sunglasses if we just increase that and you know we can fix women's interest in that rather than saying there might be very real um, things about science's culture and the idea of what a scientist looks like and the culture within in labs and within particular parts of universities that put women off as well. So instead of trying to fix those things, we try and fix women's interest. The same with leadership courses, confidence courses, trying to get rid of women's imposter syndrome. And I think what is underlying all of those assumptions is this idea that there's something wrong about women. It's a deficit model that women are lacking certain things instead of acknowledging the fact that maybe women's confidence or their interest um, or their um, ability to be good leaders is, is not about personal failings, but actually about the sorts of um, barriers that they face within the workplace. So we've done quite a lot of work in this space, looking at things like women's ambition, imposter syndrome, women's ability to be authentic at work. And what they all show is that those attitudes and beliefs that women have, while they're there, it might be the case that women have lower levels of ambition or leadership drive, 
it's because of social and structural barriers within the workplace. It's because of how they're treated by their colleagues. It's because of stereotypes and norms. It's because of a lack of role models. So what we should be doing is instead of trying to fix women, and I think inadvertently blame women for this inequality, we should be trying to fix those systems and structures that women are responding to. Um, and and I, can, I can provide more information on some of that research if that is useful. Um, the third one is about how optimistic we should be about gender equality. And I think often when we talk about uh, where we are now, there's a, there's a tendency to be quite optimistic. Things are much better than they used to be. You know, if we look back 50 years and the representation of women, or if we look back at the suffragettes, look, we can vote, you know, women are doing better at university than they ever have before. There are higher numbers of women um, as undergraduates and, you know, numbers are increasing. Um, and I think a certain recognition of optimism is good, um, but I think also a reality of how much things have stagnated and actually how slow the rate of change is, is also important. Um, depending on which um, sort of analyses you look at, some people say it's between about 130 and 300 years until we reach gender equality more broadly. Um, and that's continuing on at our sort of level of change. So. I mean, one can be optimistic about what has happened, but also be realistic. Now, one of the reasons this is really important is that people's level of optimism or their ability to actually recognize how much gender inequality still exists has implications. Um, so we've done a number of studies where we show, for example, if you look at the veterinary profession and you look at where that is now. So actually, if you look at the number of undergraduates um, studying to be vets, it's about 80% women. So a lot of people are saying, well, it's fine now, right? There's a pipeline of women coming through. But actually, when you talk to female vets, there's still a big gender pay gap. There's still really high levels of stress and there's really high levels of opting out as well. Um, but what's really interesting is that many people think that gender discrimination is no longer a problem. And the research that we've done shows that those people that think that gender inequality is no longer a problem in the veterinary profession are exactly the ones that discriminate against women. So in a study that we did, we showed that those people that are optimistic about the profession actually want to pay women less, describe them as less competent and give them less options. So we have to make sure that we're just the right level of optimism and we have to be aware that too much optimism can actually perpetuate gender discrimination. And just the final one, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm just getting there. So just the final one around intersectionality, and I don't want to talk about this too much, but really just acknowledge it as an important thing that should run through all of the things that we do, is that we shouldn't think of women as a big homogenous group that we can sort of fix with one foul swoop. The experiences within women are in some ways larger than the experiences between men and women. So if you think about women from cultural and ethnic and linguistic back, uh, diverse backgrounds, when you think about working class women or disabled women or queer women or trans women, the varieties of the experience of discrimination that they experience are, are are huge. Um, and what is really important is most of the initiatives and the policies and practice that we roll out are really framed around the experiences of white women. Um, so actually what we're doing is, is trying to fix women and we're trying to fix white women and we're actually leaving a lot of other women behind. So a lot of research that we've shown is that when you talk to black and Asian women, for example, and you ask them what they want from initiatives, it's very different from the sorts of initiatives that we have. So white women say that they want confidence training and we've already talked about why that might be problematic, but black women, for example, are saying, actually people think that I'm too confident. So, so actually trying to increase my confidence is, is not helpful. So all of those things together are things that we get wrong um, and which, which I guess point to what we should be doing and what we should be doing better. So sorry if I went a bit over time. Thanks very much. It was perfect, uh, Michelle. Thanks.
All right. So just in terms of structure, I realize I forgot that, but uh, the idea was to have all three speakers just to have 15 minutes to uh, sort of talk a bit about their work and their approach. Uh, and then uh, we have a bit of a panel discussion after which we open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, so the room now for the for the second speaker, which uh, and that is uh, Naomi Elemis. So let me start my the camera is it still working right. and can we get the thumbs up whether you hear Naomi okay uh, for the zoomers yeah Naomi can you say something yeah if yeah. whether the yeah good yeah so uh Thank you uh, for being here. It's really nice to have real uh, people in the room uh, after so long uh, teaching on the camera and everything. Uh, and so uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, and I think I'm going to follow up on uh, some of the issues that uh, Michelle uh, started to talk about. And I want to take a little bit of um, uh, social psychology perspective on. on um, so uh, one of the conclusions uh, Michelle draws is that it's not just about the women, it's about the broader system, it's about the culture. And so there is by now some agreement uh, that there is culture change is needed uh, in the workplace. But then, of course, the big question is, <laughs> how do you do that? Uh, and um, we're um, doing our, a lot of research on uh, moral psychology uh, and moral identities. And I want to take that perspective also to talk a little bit about uh, what's so difficult about achieving culture change and what to look out for when you want to do that. Uh, working. Work before clicker. Did it put, uh... Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to uh, connect to some of uh, research that we did, uh, is uh, here an example of a study we did in the university uh, where we first interviewed many people uh, about uh, organizational narratives uh, that would explain uh, inequality between uh, careers of men and women in the university. Uh, and when we asked people what would be the explanation for women being less likely to advance, uh, the first reason that everybody mentioned was, well, of course, it has to do with work-life issues. Women have children and they become less ambitious and they start working part-time. And so uh, they make these choices. They prefer to stay at home instead of keeping on the working. And uh, some people said, well, it's not really, it doesn't have anything to do with gender. The um, academic context is just very, very competitive and men suffer from this as well. And the least uh, frequently uh, mentioned uh, uh, reason for women uh, to advance less was, well, perhaps they receive less organizational support. So this was how people, women and men, talked about uh, what they perceived in the university uh, culture. But then we also continued and we did a survey and we asked uh, male and female researchers at the same university, well, what about your own situation? And what we see here is that actually we saw no difference between men and women in their career ambitions or in the choices they want to make for their career. We did see a difference in the um, amount of organizational support they experience and in particular, uh, women are much more likely, uh, much less likely than men to think that there's equal treatment. And what is interesting that these are um, different individuals, but uh, uh, drawn from the same population, right? So the same people who realize, well, I don't think women are treated equally. They still think, yeah, but the reason that women don't advance in this organization is must be because of work-life issues. So apparently there's a disjoint between people's experiences and how they perceive the culture. And so if this is what's informing gender policies, then what you see is, okay, we should have better childcare and better parental leave and better this and better that, but you're not solving this problem, right? And so it's interesting to see that uh, the way people perceive the problem uh, doesn't really reflect their own uh, experiences. Uh, now, the case that's now in the Netherlands, uh, very much in the news, but I'm sure that it's not the only case uh, that we have, is that um, this week it was uh, clear that for many years there was a pattern. Uh, somebody belittled and insulted women in public, abused his position of power, 
threatened to damage scientific careers, uh, was involved in sexual harassment, inappropriate behavior, undesirable physical approach. And the university president said, well, there have been signals for some time, but the university has not taken the victim seriously enough and waited too long before intervening. And so this is another problem, right? That uh, so many cases, when they come to light, everybody says who is in that situation says, well, we knew this was going on for years but nobody acted and nothing happened. And so these discrepancies between what we know uh, and what we do, uh, I think it relates to uh, moral psychology. And so I want to take a moral improvement perspective on this issue. Uh, and so first I want to talk a little bit about why we find it so difficult uh, to address these issues, to take action. Then I want to talk a little bit about, okay, if you want to address uh, these issues, what needs uh, have to be met? Michelle was talking about this tendency to be very optimistic, to look at, look at what everything that's already going well. Why are we so motivated to look at the things that are going well and not motivated to things that are not going well? Um, if you want to get ahead, how to do that uh, in a very practical sense and what can you change if you do that? So let's first think a bit about why do we find it so difficult? If this information is available, why don't we act on it? Uh, and um, I think it's important to realize that in the organization, there are a lot of implicit messages, right? So what we get a lot, uh, especially for these types of uh, issues relating to unfairness or relating to um, uh, social unsafety, is that we have all kinds of good intentions and then we express that or we put it on the website and say, well, this is our strategy. We are uh, favoring gender equality. We are um, protecting social safety. So now this is what we're all going to do. And it's relying very much on people's rational choice uh, and deliberate uh, decisions uh, that they go to the office every day and they realize what they need to do in order to treat everybody equally or to provide a socially safe environment. Of course, that's not the reality because in the reality, you have all kinds of standard procedures and practices that you don't even think about anymore, habits, whatever. And these send very strong implicit messages, right, about what is a desired behavior or what are the ways that get you noticed or get you promoted in this organization. And this has a much more um, uh, a stronger influence on the desired behavior. And so what we see a lot of effort is going here into stating your good intentions, but there's not a lot of effort going here to say, okay, but what are we doing? What is our promotion policy? What, how are we uh, rewarding people or punishing people for their behavior? Do we even notice that in their performance reviews or the, just look at their teaching evaluations and their research publications and the rest we don't think about. And so as long as we are not willing to change this, then the implicit message that is being sent, which is much more powerful, remains in place. Um, and so uh, what is the problem? Uh, and so one of the things that we do in our research and is summarizing a lot of studies and a lot of results is that we find it very difficult to acknowledge moral failure. So if we have the collective narrative that we are a fair and we treat everybody equally and we are an equal opportunities organization or whatever, then noticing that that's not working or even not even if yourself uh, is involved in that, but perhaps a, a teammate or somebody in your department or somebody else in your organization, we know that if people are confronted with moral failures, so people don't live up to the, to the moral goals of the organization, either themselves or somebody else, it has a lot of cost, uh, so people uh, have cognitive costs associated with that emotional cost. Uh, they experience shame and guilt, cardiovascular threat. We even see that uh, physical response. If you uh, notice somebody else uh, in your unit uh, uh, doing stuff that you don't want them uh, to do. And of course there are social costs. So there are all reasons not to notice uh, issues or not to talk about problems or not to address uh, the problems that are the behavior that counters uh, the ideals on the website. Uh, and so if we look at our research, we see that actually what uh, happens a lot is that people get into this vicious cycle uh, because uh, when we see uh, somebody uh, violating uh, rules of fair treatment, then we are inclined to confront their moral values, to say, well, don't you care about fairness or to criticize their choices? Why do you discriminate? Or to remind them of moral failures, you did something wrong. 
And what we see in our, all the studies that we do is that this actually induces negative uh, spiral because we see here that people uh, have all these self-condemning emotions, shame and guilt, and they make us withdraw from the situation and ignore the situation, not want to tackle it. Uh, people uh, perceive their coping abilities are reduced. They experience psychophysiological threat and they are actually less attentive. So we see that in uh, brain activity uh, measures that actually the early attention to even the fact that somebody is uh, um, noticing this information is uh, shut uh, down. So people don't really process that information. And so in our experiments, we do a lot of work trying to see how do we get people into this positive spiral? How to get them to improve? And so what we find is actually, uh, and that's coming back to the optimism that, that Michelle talked about, but in a different way, say, well, let's, you know, highlight share, shared norms and ideals. Let's challenge people's learning abilities, not saying you, you're a bad person, but say, look, you can learn how to do this. And not just dwelling on the past and everything that went wrong in the past, but say, no, let's do this differently in the future. And so some um, uh, legal experts, when I talk to them about this research, they find it very problematic because we say, no, we have to find evidence and we have to punish everybody and then we'll, this will deter everybody else. But from a psychological point of view, it's much more useful to say, okay, let's take forward looking a learning uh, improvement perspective and it's much more likely to open up people to the possibility that there might be a problem and that they might be motivated to change. So if this is the psychology that we have to deal with, what does it mean in practice? Uh, and so um, I usually uh, draw an analogy to the five stages of grief and so you can argue about uh, scientific uh, underpinnings but it's interesting to see even when I give talks about this topic that you see people getting depressed or you see people getting into denial or you see people saying well but what about the methodology of those studies and are your data really valid and whatever and so they're doing all kinds of cognitive labor um, to avoid the conclusion that there might be this problem and they experience a lot of negative emotions. So we have to um, take note of these emotions and say, okay, it's not just a rational choice. It's not just a deliberate decision uh, to do everything right from now on. We have to help them because they have all these negative emotions. So we have to offer them support. If they do something, we say, okay, this is good. You can do this. We can help people. They just need to uh, be very practical, need very practical support. We can educate them on what are the underlying mechanisms. We can call for action, but make it a little bit light, not make it you know, these angry women and they're never satisfied, but make a little bit cheerful uh, 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 calls for action and uh, keep uh, sharing personal stories because a lot of the university administrators think, oh, we have all these provisions in place and everything must be going uh, well. And so continuing to share the personal stories that there are still groups or faculties or places where people do have these experiences, that's a very powerful tool also to engage people uh, emotionally and uh, see the urgency of that. And so one of the ways we put it into practice was by uh, developing a website and so this is Athena's Angels. And so we do this deliberately. So this is making a little bit light of it, not making it very, you know, we are scientists and we tell you that you're doing everything wrong. And so we made this website uh, and it has different uh, sections. So one section, we call it Athena's Wisdom, is where we collect uh, scientific evidence on all kinds of topics. And sometimes people say, okay, so I have uh, an issue with uh, gender bias in teaching. Where can, I find, uh, where can I find the evidence? And so we make newsletters and we refer them to this evidence because many people are working in other disciplines don't really realize there's a bunch of uh, psychologists or, or behavioral scientists doing research on it and that there's actually data out there and they don't know where to find it. So this is one thing that we try to do. We collect the information. The second thing we try to do is to uh, get them to share their personal stories. We call that angel alerts and just to give all kinds of, so there's all kinds of stories and you can uh, blow them up and then you can read about it. And this is also to remind the people who are responsible in the leadership that all these personal stories continue to happen. And these are the experiences that people encounter. Um, we have uh, people uh, asking us questions. Uh, so in Holland, you used to have in uh, women's magazines this dear, uh, dear Lita or whatever, you could write my husband is, well, I don't know, doing something and what should I do? So we take the same format, but people ask, okay, I need to negotiate about my salary or my male colleague was uh, uh, given a, um, a permanent contract and I was not, what can I do? And so we try to help them. And so some of these issues are of course generic. And so we try to support the women who write to us. 
we also try to, uh, in a slightly um, light way, to take action. So one of the things we do, for instance, there was the president of the Dutch uh, Science uh, Council who wrote about, oh, research is just like top sports and only one person can be the first and only one person can win and whatever. And so we wrote in the newspaper to say, well, here's all the evidence looking at the negative um, implications of a very competitive climate for uh, integrity, for knowledge sharing, for social safety and whatever. And so we try to respond publicly to these issues and we collect them on the site. Um, and then finally, if there's something good happening, uh, then we also try to praise people not to get everybody very depressed, but also show examples of good uh, initiatives. So this website actually uh, tries to incorporate all these um, insights from uh, the psychology that we have and from the studies that we have on the resistance and on the emotional barriers that people experience and how to overcome them. And so if you take this on board, then the next question is, okay, so how do you generate progress? If an organization wants to change or wants to change their culture or whatever, how, how do they do that and how can we support them? And what we find very interesting, so here's a study where we examined a number of organizations who said, oh, we are koplopers, I don't know how to say it, we are front runners or whatever, in terms of uh, circular and inclusive um, uh, policies in our organization. So we went to all these 70 something organizations and we asked them a few questions and said, okay, so what's your goal? Well, many of them said, well, goal, goal? We just want to be inclusive, right? And so what uh, is your um, strategy? How are you going to achieve that? Strategy, strategy, we never thought about a strategy. Uh, and is somebody who's responsible for making that happen? No, nobody is responsible. So in the end, we only had about half of the frontrunner organizations who said, oh, we're frontrunners and this is very important for them, actually were thinking about this in a practical way, is that if you want to achieve this, you have to have a goal, you have to think about the strategy and somebody has to be responsible for advancing that. And so it's very interesting that with these moral goals of treating everybody fairly or whatever, we tend to think that as long as we agree with each other in the room, oh, yes, we're going to do this and everybody agrees, then that's enough. And so say, no, treat it as any other business goal, treat it as any other strategic goal and just, you know, do it in a, in a business-like manner and just monitor how you're doing and how you're advancing. And so to support that, we've developed what we call the Netherlands Inclusiveness Monitor, where we go to different organizations with the same questionnaire and we collect a lot of information about their employees, but also about the policy in that organization. Um, and so, uh, and we try to feedback um, the information from that. And so one of the things we see, and this very much resonates with what Michelle was talking about, her first point, just uh, focusing on the numbers, we see in a lot of organizations there, all their policies are, uh, are mainly uh, focused on, you know, getting in these people, getting them into the organization. And these are, it's a broad sample of organization, but also includes university organizations. And still, they don't do everything that they could do, but at least much of what they're doing is getting people in, uh, getting them on board, but then, you know, monitoring whether they also advance in the organization, monitoring why they are leaving, they are much less likely to do so. And so they think about it in a very superficial uh, way, I think. And so one of the things that we do is also we assess the climate for inclusion against the benchmark of the working population. And what we see here is very interesting because usually uh, what they do, if they ask these questions themselves, they calculate an average for the whole population in the organization, right? And so if you have the average, then of course the majority members uh, weigh in uh, more heavily than the minority members. So we made a split. And so what we see here is actually the majority in these organizations who are self-proclaimed uh, working on inclusion. They think, oh, we're doing very well. We are participating in the monitor, so we must be good. But the people who are in the minority actually don't, don't feel this, don't experience this. And for many organizations, this is really an eye-opener to say, oh, so you can relate the policy to the experiences of employees. Oh, we never thought about that. And even that simple thing already makes a big difference. Another thing that we do is to say, well, many of your policies are about women or uh, people of color or whatever, if you can see that they are different, then they are target groups. And what we find actually when we ask people, do you feel that you're different uh, from your colleagues, that there are many people who say, yeah, I feel different, but other people don't realize this because of, I don't know, my political orientation or my sexual identity, or I don't know what, or my cultural background or being a first generation in this, in this organization or whatever. And so having the policies only focusing on these known differences also makes you leave out many people. So it's another reason not just to 
focus on the numbers. And so this is what we do in a very practical manner to help these organizations. So we continue to do this with more organizations, more people, and we give them back the information. So we try to say, okay, look, this is how you're doing. So you should do more about, you know, who is leaving and why, because you're not taking advantage from that. What can you do? Do you have a vision? Do you have a goal? Uh, are you measuring progress? Well, not at all. And so this is how we can help them also uh, improve their policies in a very practical way. Uh, we publish these types of uh, fact sheets, what we call them, to say, okay, don't just think that everything is solved uh, once everybody has uh, been to the anti-bias uh, training. Um, we uh, teach them how to formulate smart goals for um, uh, diversity uh, measures. Uh, we uh, try to educate them about how to get support in the organization and what to do to get support from different levels of the organization. Uh, and we try to help them to develop uh, measures to assess the effectiveness of their, of their policies. And so we also organize workshops where we use these materials to really work with diversity officers and with managers on um, yeah, evaluating their own policies in this way. And so if we do this, what, what will it change? Well, uh, one uh, big um, uh, theme that I've been working on for the past few years is social safety in Dutch academia. This was an assignment from the Ministry of Education, uh, and I was working on that on behalf of the uh, Royal Academy of Sciences in the Netherlands. And we really tried to make an uh, integrative um, analysis where we said, well, this is about organizational structure where every time people get into the same problems because of power differences or because of structural uh, characteristics, and you have to have also structural solutions to improve that. We talked about the organizational culture, saying, well, we don't really talk about behavior a lot in the university. We think it's uh, not uh, worthwhile or people don't know how to do this. So if you want to do this differently, you really have to organize this differently. And we talked about um, what to do when there are problems. And we see here that the duty of care is not a very well structured. Uh, people are in a dilemma who to support the victim or the complainant or the culprit and what to do, how to treat everybody fairly. And so we also made recommendations for uh, how to do that. And so we created the website, an interactive website that contains all these different uh, components. So we have the personal stories, we have the scientific analysis, we have the practical recommendations. Uh, and so people can go there. We also give a calculation of the cost of having an incident, uh, which can be up to hundreds and thousands of uh, euros, just to give uh, people who say, oh, we don't have time for this, or we don't have money for this, uh, to give them uh, the information that, well, by doing nothing, uh, you're also wasting a lot of uh, you, uh, resources and you can also spend them differently. And we try to give a positive vision for the future to get people going with very practical uh, materials. And again, in a light, a bit cartoony, fun way to make it a little bit light instead of oh, this whole list of things that you need to do and you can only go wrong, but also give them ways to do it right. So if you want to move towards change of a system or change of a culture, um, I think it's important that you first understand the sources of resistance. You understand why people want to focus on the numbers, why they want to focus on everything that goes well and are reluctant to address things that are going wrong. These emotions stand in the way of doing that. Uh, so you have to uh, want to do something to counter these emotional responses and to take on board the research on how to do that. Um, I think you really have to help people by organizing practical tools and really teaching them, oh, you have your policies and now what's the goal and how do you evaluate the goal and treat it as a, as a researcher, right? Because the people who develop these policies don't think as researchers, don't think of organizational systems or don't think of this in the way that we uh, organizational scientists or behavioral scientists do. And then you can aim for systemic change by working on all these things and doing it in a stepwise uh, fashion. So that's what I wanted to okay. Thank share. you very much, uh, Naomi. Yeah. All right, and then uh, our final speaker, uh, Marit. Uh, I might just, Charlie, would you be able to help getting out here? Marit, uh, do you have slides, Marit? Or... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know if the sound is a little bit. Yeah, I might just check my sound again, or not. Can you hear me? Sound, sound is not that great. Yeah, yeah it had the wrong microphone. So this oh, right, right. This is much better. Yeah, go for it, mate. 
So I will just go to the start of my presentation and hopefully I can make up some time. Um, and I want to share this screen. So you should see my, um, my title slide right now. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, fantastic. So good morning, everyone. My name is Marit Klacht. Um, I'm also Dutch. Uh, that's a coincidence, sorry. Uh, and I'm an associate professor in agricultural economics at the University of Western Australia, where I am also pro vice chancellor for diversity and inclusion. So I will talk to you today about a from a I guess practitioner's perspective about how we at the university developed a strategy for gender equity and more broadly diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I hope that I can give an example of a strategy that's not just a lo lofty goal and intentions, um, but actually a practical plan that can address some of the structural issues that the other two speakers um, mentioned. So I wanted to start with a bit of a history uh, of our institution, because I think that's important to understand where we are and where we're coming from. So we had a vice chancellor towards the end of the last century, um, uh, called Professor Robson, who was a real champion for equity. He funded and led a, um, a leadership development program for women, which ran for um, 20 years. And that was a amazing program that wasn't meant to teach women necessarily skills to change them, but very much taught participants that um, women in leadership roles don't need to lean in but taught us and made us aware of the structures at a traditional university that don't fit how women may view the world. So I think that understanding is, especially 20 years ago, was the, is the first step in understanding um, those syst systemic barriers. And then we can, can address those barriers. And Professor Robson also supported a very generous and flexible parental leave scheme, for example, that any type of parents could access, uh, no matter your gender. Um, and all that, that worked really well. And it also led to that vice chancellor being named national diversity and inclusion champion twice in the uh, early 2000s. And UWA getting awarded a citation for a national employer of choice by um, the federal government's equal opportunity for women in the workplace for more than 10 years, which was really amazing. And part of the reason, what, reason why I went to UWA when I was awarded the job. We also used to have a well-resourced equity office um, in the human resource department, which offered professional development, training, uh, an ally program. We were the first universities with an ally program in 2002, which creates, um, which aims to create a more inclusive campus for LGBTIQA plus people. Um, offered a suite of, I don't really want to call them training, but courageous conversation workshops, which encouraged that critical thinking and reflection about how our own cultural background and the institutional culture um, affects how we operate. And that really drove a lot of change um, for and, and improved conditions for staff and students. Unfortunately, we then went when that vice chancellor left, and I'm going through this story to indicate that it can that it can really be one person who makes or breaks the culture in an organization. We went through this series of vice chancellors who implemented a structural change program. So any um, academics in this room and online will recognize this, I'm sure. So during that period, um, a lot of structures that existed, including the equity office, including the leadership development for women program, they were all taken apart. And we had to start this progress of rebuilding um, the, the equity and inclusive focus of the organization. And I think I'm not alone in really regretting that, uh, that happening, but fortunately we, have started rebuilding. And one of our one of those three vice chancellors, four vice chancellors that we had in the past six years um, was from the UK and they wanted us to be part of the Sage Athena Swan process. So 
previous speaker also mentioned Athena. So um, the Athena Swan process is this international um, accreditation body that um, awards tertiary education. So universities and research organi organizations um, for taking steps on improving gender equity, diversity and inclusion. So if you're, if you're interested in the topics, you should really check out their website. Um, UQ is a member, so all staff and students at UQ have access to the resources that they have. Um, the Australian organization is called Science in Australia Gender Equity, so SAGE. And UWA was part of the first cohort of organizations that went through that SAGE Athena Swan pilot process. And that really helped us to identify our strengths and weaknesses in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We collected a lot of information, uh, which, despite what Michelle says, concentrating on the numbers misses a bunch of the story. It's also an important part of the story because it provides the evidence and therefore maybe the impetus to do something. Um, it certainly helps us collecting data. Uh, for example, we provided evidence that there are indeed men overrepresented at senior academic levels, which affects the behavioral and cultural aspects of the team there. And if it's mostly men in professorial and executive leadership positions, then there's more likely to be some bias towards that status quo and um, towards recruiting and promoting and recognizing people that look like you, in this case, senior men in professorial positions. Um, now, one reason why this Athena Swan program um, really set off our journey, our, our new journey, I would say, is that we had senior executive commitments. Um, the vice chancellor actually funded um, a part-time position for um, a woman professor, uh, Carolyn Oldham, Oldham, who led the um, self-assessment team. And the self-assessment team also involved the SDBC, so the senior deputy vice chancellor, who is like the manager of the whole organization. And that in helped raise awareness at the executive level, but it also increased the workload dra dram dramatically for that SDBC. So the SDBC is responsible for implementing the Athena Swan Action Plan. And if you've ever seen an Athena Swan Action Plan, there are you know, pages and pages of, of things that we propose to do. Um, they also chair our Inclusion and Diversity Committee, which is part of that rebuilding the equity structure is we um, set up this committee, which replaces an Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee um, advising the Vice Chancellor. And I have, um, the five working groups on the screen here that support that um, DEI committee, including the gender equity working group, which was also chaired by the SDBC. So with the SDBC responsible for all these major inclusion and diversity initiatives, his um, workload increased substantially, which led to the um, creation of, of my role, um, PVC, Pro Vice Chancellor for Inclusion and Diversity. So, um, this is only a part-time role, which suits me really well because I get to do my research as well. But I think, and this is when I'm starting to get into the implementation of our DEI initiatives, I think um, creating a specific academic role for inclusion and diversity has been important because it, well, it signals that the university is willing to dedicate one of their staff to this topic. Um, creating it at the PVC level shows that they're looking for leadership, not just a manager. Um, someone who actually provides direction and having an academic in the role is important because well, I understand the academic structures of the university, which is hard often for a professional area of the university, although I had to learn everything about how the professional side of the university has been set up. Um, but I found that the academic staff are more willing to listen to another academic rather than a um, professional person from HR, um, which is unfortunate, but um, it's what we've experienced. You may know that I've used the terms diversity and inclusion, inclusion and diversity kind of interchangeably, which is where I started a year ago, but it was important to me to also include equity um, in, in that portfolio, which is why we uh, changed the name to diversity, equity, and inclusion 
which fall pretty much all on the Maori elites. And one of the biggest things that I had to do was develop a DEI management plan, which is a um, legislative requirement under the Western Australian Equal Opportunity Act. Um, but also just to bring our university together and really thinking through where are we going with this university. So that process started in November last year, and we just launched our DEI strategy yesterday, in fact. So I started developing this strategy by really reading a lot of other DEI strategies. The United States are much further in their DEI um, journey, and they have, lot, they have big EDI departments with well-articulated initiatives that I, I went through just to see what the um, what a plan would look like. But also, I am an academic, so I read a lot of literature on what works, what doesn't work, so that I had the evidence um, to inform the DEI strategy. So it includes all these, these five things about our commitment, our what we currently look like, where we want to go. And I'll, I'll show you a bit about that um, in a moment. But what I wanted to um, really draw out is the extensive consultation process that we went through to develop this plan. Because we wanted to experience that, we wanted to understand that experience of staff and students, which was mentioned in the previous presentation. So I really for, did an extensive process trying to identify what are the issues that our staff and students face. And we've heard a lot of stories um, about what is important, what are the challenges that people face in different places of the organization and use those to translate it into where do we want to be? What actions do we need to take to get there? So that consultation was also really important to, to gather, um, oh, there you go, there's all of them, um, to get support and buy-in for this plan um, and foster that the ownership of the strategy that we eventually launched yesterday. So I, I talked to every executive member multiple times. We did focus group with senior leaders. So that's all directors and heads of schools across the university. There, there are about 30 or 40 of those. Um, talked to a lot of staff and students in focus group, but also did a university-wide survey that received more than 400 responses. So they're, they're, we really build up that awareness that this was happening. There was a, a strategy with uh, the corporate communications team, which has been really helpful in putting out um, increasing number of um, articles, for example, in our weekly newsletter that have a DEI focus but also very much an individual focus. So stories from staff about how they celebrate Diwali, for example, or why they are an ally. Um, lots of individual stories to really bring home that DEI is not a lofty goal at, from the top, but affects all of us. So that is, um, that's the front page of the strategy that we just launched yesterday that has been um, endorsed by the executive. But I'd like to dwell a little bit about some of the challenges that we this, uh, that we encountered. And that is the, the final bit of my presentation. So first and foremost, uh, important was the need for clear support from the senior executive. So um, DEI cannot just be a bottom-up um, initiative. It needs to also be prioritized at the executive level. Otherwise, any proposals for change will not go anywhere. Um, so, and it was very clear from our focus groups and survey that the staff didn't think that DEI was important to our leaders. And without that demonstrated value from the top, any other middle managers or other staff are not going to take up the baton and, and, and fight for cultural change. So, but luckily, um, we have a very strong sponsors in our executive now, and um, we have gone through executive changes also specifically to employ th those sponsors um, and but also I work a lot with the executive providing them the, the evidence that diversity is important because it leads to better research more innovation etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, we are we will be better able to service our students um, 
So I think that has been convincing the senior management as well. But I think there's also a bit of keeping up with our peers. Um, in our case, we benchmark ourselves against the group of eight. So what they do, we will also. We often got this comment in our consultations that we just need more training, but that is not what the evidence shows. Not just training is not enough. Um, in fact, there's even some evidence that if you mandate training, it can cause an opposite effect. So instead of providing training and mandating training, we actually worked towards setting up a clearer uh, competency framework where staff can really see, oh, if I want to know more about this, this is what I need to do and also plan that earlier so that people can get it in their diaries. I won't dwell on that. I mostly want to talk about those other two challenges. It's setting targets and, and translating that into action. So the discussion about targets was very much about, um, we need to set key performance indicators. Um, there was this proposal to develop an institutional diversity in index, which was quite a mechanical way to express how we're doing. Um, and then we would score points if the metrics improved or lose them if they deteriorated. But I agree with Michelle that concentrating on an index like that tends to obscure what we actually need to do. That can become a goal in itself, right? Rather than a means to address those structural inequities that we, um, we want to change. So we, um, we hope that we have in this, in this strategy really focused on changing the structures, changing the processes and ultimately changing the culture of the organization. So I'll show you in a moment what we've proposed. Um, but to, it was also really important that we just write, that we don't write another vague strategy with our objectives, but also get um a, have a clear action plan with what we needed to do um to achieve change so that action plan development and the target setting was what took most of the eight to ten months of writing the strategy um so we and the difficulties with actions what we have limited resources available so i need to needed to be realistic about what can we achieve in the two and a half years with the people and the money that we have available. So I've set up the plan with a few big projects that are still affordable, but also small wins. So we can keep making progress, um, but also have scaffolded those projects so that we can start doing things and maybe progress that after 2025, which is the next stage. And a lot of the actions are also not targeting um uh, our targeting culture and behavior and looking at you know what are the achievements that we reward and value revising the workload model revising the promotion process and valuing through through our actual actions and rewards that we give to staff the any cultural uh, changes that the women often bring to an organization um so my last two slides are just showing you, and you can find the plan on the website if you want to ha have a, a deeper dive, is first of all, in the end, we do have indicators in this plan because some people just need something that can be measured. And that table has led to so many discussions, um, which have actually been quite valuable because we it made us understand more about what we have, but also the challenges in how do we even manage staff data um, because not all staff even shares information about themselves because they don't feel safe. So that is an important thing to, to address. Um, it also includes student targets, which are guarded, guided by the, um, the HEP funding. Um, but I feel that these indicators should be a result of the actions we take. They shouldn't be a, a lagging a indicator. I also wanted some leading indicators is the, the terminology. So. That's why we call them indicators rather than targets. Uh, uh, my goal really is to make this plan a more, to, to make this university a more welcoming and inclusive place. So um, addressing the culture of the organization. And that's why I uh, have put in um, some non-quantitative targets as well, which are really benchmarking our achievements. So okay, aiming for Athena Swan by 2025, 
hopefully bring back gender um, an employer of choice citation and have at least um, silver accreditation from Pride in Diversity, which is for LGBTI um, inclusion. And there is specific actions that need to be taken to get there. And it's not about what you achieved, but also what you've done to get there. Um, and I won't really have time to go through all the actions that we defined in the plan, but I want to just demonstrate that we have a, um, about 22 actions in this plan with a couple of bigger projects, such as a, a talent management plan that's going to look at our hiring and recruitment and staff retention processes, but also small wins such um, inclusive language guide or annual communication plan on DEI. Um, and there's different types of actions from developing a tangible thing or an event to setting up structures that will help in our next steps. And uh, the most important thing to point out is that we have um, responsible owners for each of those steps that I have that I directly follow up with, with to ensure that they're actually doing what we are promising. So my conclusion is um, a couple of reflections on what, what works what has worked at the university, and I'll, I've already said it, but having support from the top is so important. Uh, we have fortunately now um, some new people in the executive and in directive roles that specifically focus on DEI. And I think having a PVC for DEI also is a good signal and, um, and helps. We need buy-in from senior leaders. So that's not just the executive, but also heads of schools, professors, directors. Uh, and I'm sure we don't have the, that buy-in from everyone yet, but by really talking to all those um, and presenting the plan, we're getting we're getting there. Um, those senior leaders have to be trusted by by the staff, and uh, I think it's helped that there's an academic in the PVC position. It's really remarkable how much easier it is for me to access heads of schools, for example, than colleagues in HR. Um, we have a combination of objectives, lagging targets, but also leading indicators, and that the action plan has clear responsibilities assigned, and that I will follow up with those people on, are you actually doing what we're promising to do? So my next step will be to visit uh, local areas, such as individual schools, and work with them to develop then local action plans. Maybe it's only one or two things. But I want those schools and professional directors to come up with their own objectives. They can be big, they can be small, but something that they can do to really own that change that they're that they're hoping to achieve, um, which will be much better than imposing a blanket KPI on, on leaders, which is where we started when I was appointed last year. And I think that's where, yep, that's where I'm going to end. Didn't catch up on the time, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're all very passionate about this topic. But my uh, my details are here, and I'll uh, I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you so much, Monique. Can I stop sharing? I don't know how. Uh, I think those were three very insightful and and really very rich and and uh, sort of thought provoking uh, uh, presentation. So thank you so much. And I also think that it's really amazing to see how basically the same points come back in different shapes and. And I think there's a lot of commonality in, in what all of the three speakers uh, mentioned. I thought, uh, given that we are indeed uh, a bit over time in what we planned, but I really think it would be great to now hand over to you guys and to do a Q&A, so, because we really want to hear what you think. And if you ask a question, we'll, we'll give people on Zoom an opportunity. I think you have them in the chat, right? Uh, can we maybe get the chat open and uh, uh, shall we? Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you ask a question, you can ask one of the three panelists uh, or just to all of them, but just try and not to drag it out too long so that we can have a lot of people actually uh, in sort of uh, asking questions. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, would you, Charlie, you've been monitoring the chat, right? What, would you like to start or? Um, Okay. All right. So maybe the best way to do it for the Zoomers is to put your question in the chat. Yeah, you want to just. Uh, okay. Well, I'll I'll ask uh, first here in the room, and then um, 
uh, you know, think about the question you may have, and then you may want to so, sort of ask it yourself if if uh, comfortable with that. Anyone here in the room? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll give you the microphone. Oh, thank you. Um, super interesting to listen to these. Um, I'm just wondering, from my experience, I've been doing a lot on um, cultural change around child safeguarding. So very, very similar points that have come across. But one thing that we've learned from the practical side, this is not from academia, is that really to shift from that policy process and establishing policies, yes, senior leadership buy-in is, is critical, but that there's a need for people internally to go through a very personal change process. And that requires giving space to that. It's, it's sort of peer-to-peer -peer conversations. It's deep diving into their own sort of biases and psychologies. And I'm just wondering where's the space for that within, within any of the proposals that were um, presented? Yeah, yeah. great question. Uh, is any one of the three of you want to comment on that, respond to that? Yeah, Anomi, yeah. uh, you go, yeah. Well, so it's actually when we were talking about this social safety uh, uh, issues, that was a question that came up a lot. And it also, I think, resonates with people saying, yeah, that all takes a lot of time. And then we're wasting time uh, talking to each other and we don't get down to the real business. Uh, and so this was one of the reasons why we actually uh, calculated the cost oh. of uh, not doing this uh, to make people realize um, Sorry, how much uh, we're wasting also resources and wasting time by, you know, um, having all these unproductive interactions. So I think uh, that helped us at least to give people different perspective on uh, why it is important to uh, use this time more uh, for preventing problems rather than uh, addressing them after the fact. And then because if there is a crisis, you have to do something uh, regardless and just, you know, making people aware that it's going to happen sooner or later. It's going to cost you enormous amount of time and resources, and reputational damage, and why not invest those same resources at the front end? So it was a different way of thinking about it that helped us a little bit uh, to create that space. But we still have to see what is going to happen, of course. I don't know if uh, Michelle or Marit uh, want to respond to that too. Yeah, Marit, I see. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I think. The, the, the safe space is very important and we have tried to create that by having these um, by having individual conversations mostly at the, the manager level and um, but also we have um, well well I have I guess uh, created we have these working groups that are staff working groups there is um, where, where where people and we advertise you know who are the who are on these working groups and the chairs of the working groups get input from staff uh, uh, which sometimes works better because they may, might directly know the chair uh, and the working groups are focusing on specific topic uh, um, but we also have those we've had those focus groups which are which were very frank <laughs> and we try to do those with um with groups where people were supported by their peers. So we didn't have, you know, executive and senior and staff all in one room, but for example, only staff or only students, which 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 also helps. But uh, and the next step for me is to to discuss um, and, and to go and meet the individual places across the university um, and to see what's going on. But it's a it is a difficult no, no, it's not, it's a challenging um Thing to it's challenging to create safe spaces at an organization as big as a, as a university and um why and it's definitely one of those one of the things that we're still working on we have created a network uh grassroots network is the terminology we use on that on diversity and equity um but it's um which worked really well when we had faculties but people really knew each other, but we don't have those faculties anymore. And having a university-wide network has proven hard. So maybe we need to go back to, to smaller groups. People just feel more comfortable in, in smaller groups amongst peers, for example, just STEM or just, um, which I don't really like having those disciplinary group, but um, it does, it has shown to work better. Um, so we're, it's that's part of the, the journey we're still on, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have a next question here, uh, Tyler. 
thanks to all three speakers. Uh, this is for those online. This is Tyler Okamoto from the Business School. Um, I have a related question. Um, so some of the some of the work that that we've been doing in this space lately has suggested that the why that we're using to promote the culture change is is really important, particularly at the levels that that our previous question was was mentioning. That for a senior executive making a business case for uh, you know, EDI is is relatively straightforward because that's what they do. But for the rest of the of the culture, um, we're finding that those business case justifications don't seem to translate into you know motivation to actually do anything about it at the at the grassroots level. And so I was I was curious as uh, if our three speakers have you know, uh, have any experience at, at kind of mobilizing that grassroots level and, and, uh, and specifically in how we, how we can find the balance between the business case and the moral case, uh, kind of relevant to your, your points, Naomi. I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that to start off with, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, sure. um, yeah, yeah, Tyler, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think the business case comes from quite a sort of neoliberal approach to sort of things, right? Like everything has to add value, it has to be growth, it has to do all of those things. And I think you're right, but I think also the business case has a number of problems. So not just in motivation and, and how to motivate people, but also what outcomes you're looking for. So the idea that, you know, if you increase gender equality, you should have some sort of monetary outcome is wild to me, right? Like, why should women necessarily make things better? I mean, just bringing them in and nothing changing is also a good outcome, right? Like, just partly because of the moral case. But also there's, often you see when you use a business case analogy, people then often pull on very essentialist views to try and make that happen. Women have a better way of leading or they bring a different type of care or they bring, a, you know, all of those sorts of things. So often the business case actually reinforces stereotypes and those sorts of things, often inadvertently, but that's the language that you have to bring in if women are going to bring in added value is that they bring in something different. So I think both of those things are sort of problematic. But I think the other thing, so at the moment, I'm working um, with the Office for Women, the, the federal government to put together the, th the new theory of change that's going to underlie the sort of national strategy of gender equality for the next decade. So this is quite a big responsibility that we're doing and we're trying to get the balance right also between the evidence base so what does the research tell us um but also trying to bring in that lived experience aspect as well because partly if we only use the evidence base we're sort of bound by the research that we do and we also know the research is flawed it uh, tends to only look at sort of certain people it only tends to look at certain outcomes and those sorts of things so I think the evidence base is really strong and as an academic I'm always saying let's look at the evidence base but if we only solely look at that we also miss out on a whole lot because we know our evidence base is also often not intersectional it's not inclusive and the lived experiences of particular communities or particular experiences really add sort of value to that understanding and I think then helps with that other aim you were talking about about mobilizing sort of grassroots sorts of things but also potentially mobilizing particular communities that might not feel represented by the research or the business case or any of those sorts of things so to make it much more intersectional in that way I don't know whether that answers your question also add perhaps uh, yeah so I think uh, I agree uh, completely with Michelle that uh, the business case uh, has its own uh, issues but I think there are also dangers to the moral case or at least um, what tends to happen is that the moral case is being presented from the negative point of view so um, pointing out all the problems and pointing out all the ways in which people are being unfair um, as a way to motivate them and uh, when I take my uh, evidence from my own studies uh, seriously, I realize that that's not the way to do it because so a lot of the people on the work floor who say, oh, it's not an important problem or we have other things to do or I'm not motivated or whatever, I think a lot of that is driven by uh, emotion um, and a lot of that is driven by uh, perhaps uh, fear guilt, uh, insecurity, um, not knowing if things change, will I still be successful? Or if these skills are being required, will I be able to display them? And so acknowledging those negative emotions and not pushing people from a negative um, uh, moral uh, um, uh, condemnation, 
but uh, uh, trying to uh, draw them out by, you know, painting a positive ideal for the future and then making the moral case, um, but in a positive way, uh, might be more motivating. So make it easy, make it fun, make it, you know, doable. Uh, and these are the things that we try to do uh, to get across that. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh... Oh, Marit. Yeah, yeah, sure, Marit. Uh, uh, what? Uh, so maybe just just unmute and maybe uh, just. Uh, yeah, um, I, I really, I, I totally agree with what was said before. But unfortunately, I would say that we are often still dealing with these traditional um, men dominated leadership structures who may not be convinced by the moral case, what do we do? Right? Like ultimately we want to change that leadership, right? But at the moment we don't have, we may not have those lead, those type of leaders that we hope we would have. So what do we do now? Michelle, Some, I see you on mute. So yeah, go for it. Yeah, sometimes I think the, if you do have to use a business case analysis, doing the business case of not doing it is actually better than doing the business case of doing it. So instead of having the argument that women add value and blah, 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 and are different, you can say, actually, this is the cost of not doing it. You know, you will have women leaving, you will have high turnover, you'll have sexual harassment cases and those sorts of things. So actually, for me, that notion of business case, like the cost of not doing it is, is well, it's more convincing to me, but maybe that's because I'm convinced oh. Yeah, to me that's part of a business case as well and that is exactly like the the melbourne example of losing uh, losing funding um the uk example of not getting being able to access funding if you don't meet athena swanzu but those sort of things yeah yeah absolutely sorry can i add yeah yeah sure uh, no because it's also um we're not um i think we're dealing with different people who are in different stages so when i talk about these different stages of grief or acceptance or whatever um i realize that different people are in different stages or different groups are in different stages and so perhaps you need multiple things in your repertoire and to draw out the thing that works for that situation or for that individual and then over time you may get to a different stage and do shift to a different instrument so that's also something uh, to keep in mind that you no know, first people need to be convinced that there's a problem okay now they're convinced now they need to perhaps believe in the business case now they believe this now now it's time for the moral argument so um that's also something to look out for when when or whom uh, to approach in what way yeah. All right. I uh, think we're slowly uh, time probably to wrap up, but uh, as the chair, I just, you know, I'll do whatever I want. Right. So I actually, I'm going to ask the final question. And that's more sort of for each three of you personally. What I would like to know is how optimistic are you? I know, Michelle, that optimism is perhaps, you know, sometimes is leading to, uh, you know, inaction. Uh, so certainly we don't want that, but just just if you reflect on what is happening in the field and, you know, there is a lot has changed in the last 10 years, last 20 years. So are we actually making progress or in 10 years time, do you think that we're in a better position or are you a bit more pessimistic about where we're going? Yeah, so just a quick sort of view of, uh, and it could be a very personal thing. Are you thinking we're making progress on this agenda? Michelle, yeah? Can I be negative or well, not negative? But, you know, I'm generally a relentlessly optimistic person in general, but I do think we've seen a lot of stagnation um, lately. If the one thing that probably does bring me optimism is, is when I see sort of young people, early career researchers or undergraduate students or those sorts of things. I mean, I think about gender equality more broadly, if I see the March for Justice, if I see, you know, this real feeling of trying to, to enact change, I guess where my pessimism comes from is also with a broad sort of, I mean, I love academia, but it, I, I mean, I feel like there is a, a sort of neoliberalization of, of academia more generally. And I think that does dampen a lot of the things that we're trying to do on the gender equality front, because it does seem so focused on outcomes, on success, on ambition, on a lot of these male dominated uh, sort of areas. And I feel like in some ways that culture is exacerbating in a bit of a neoliberal area. So I think burning down capitalism is probably the thing we need to do alongside of trying to fix some of these gender equality issues. 
Okay. All right. All right. Uh, how about you, Naomi? <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes I'm optimistic and sometimes I'm pessimistic. Um, so I think some of the things are moving, moving very slowly. Uh, but I'm also thinking of a statistician that I sometimes work with. He's talking a lot about tipping points. So um, I'm also hoping uh, that some issues get to a stage that, you know, you get um, across the tipping point and then perhaps it can go very quickly. So I think uh, let's uh, keep on trying. All right, we're getting a bit more positive again. <laughs> Wait, uh, you, a final yeah. word for you. I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm, I'm also eternally optimistic. My work is on climate change. Uh, and you have to be optimistic, otherwise you just uh, can't go on. Um, and same in uh, equity, I am optimistic. We've seen so much change and I think you can only get better with every new generation. Um, but it... it Depends also, maybe we'll see um, a divergence in the type of institutions, like institutions that are these traditional core research output focused uh, institutions and maybe other institutions where people actually want to work. Uh, we, we see that locally um, already here in Perth, for example, one university really positioning themselves as we are the, the welcoming, inclusive university where everybody can belong. Um, they don't rate high in, in research rankings or, or, or whatever, uh, whereas other universities target that specifically. So maybe that's what we'll see. Um, I, I don't, it's really about what we value as a, as a society. It's not just about universities. And I'm, I'm hopeful that that will slowly change um, with, with every, every new election. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, all right, I would like to finish here and like to, but really I would like to thank all three speakers. I thought it was very insightful and very sort of thoughtful ideas uh, coming here. And uh, thank you for sharing all those ideas and your research. Uh, so can I please have uh, applause for all of you again? Yeah. All right, and this uh, is then the end, probably. Uh, I'll just probably hand over to Winifred, who might want to say something about the next PEPs. Oh, thanks, Yolanda. Uh, what a wonderful start to our series, eh? What wonderful speakers. Thank you so much. Um, our next uh, PEPs in November is going to cover the similarly easy and simple question, why people, brackets, don't protect nature and biodiversity. And our speakers will be Hugh Possingham, the former Queensland chief scientist, ARC laureate and brilliant ecologist who's been working in policy, as well as um, Tassiano Milfont, the former editor of Journal of Environmental Psych, who has recently accepted an 80% role in the New Zealand Department of the Environment. So we really look forward to hearing from them and their perspectives. Thanks, Yolanda, and thanks to everyone. Mm -hmm.